Today we're going to talk about matrix systems. Matrix systems are essential when it comes to filling class 2 restorations. They allow us to confine the filling material within the walls of the preparation and allow us for optimum condensation, certainly when it comes to amalgam. Uh, without this, you would find that your amalgam would just squish out everywhere. Remember when you were filling class 1 with extensions, you would have to somehow secure with your finger uh, on the lingual or the occlusal surface uh, to allow the amalgam to actually get condensed. So it's the same situation here, but you can't get your finger into the interproximal area. Uh, and certainly uh, the amalgam would just extrude itself gingively and buckly and lingually. So the, the matrix, when in place correctly, will keep the filling material confined to your preparation. It'll also help you reestablish a proximal contact, which is essential when it comes to restoring your class two restoration. Uh, and of course, having physiologic contours to your restoration and if your matrix is nice and clean and clear without wrinkles, it's going to provide a very smooth surface texture to your restoration. There are a couple systems that are available. The Toffelmeyer matrix is the most simple and easily accessible matrix system. And that is certainly the one that we see right here at the very top left hand. Uh, and that is in your restorative kits. And then we have the T-band, which is just to the right of that. And that's a specialized type of matrix that we would use in pediatric cases primarily. And it's assembled very quickly. Uh, it's a long strip of dead soft metal that, that has a T-shape to it that can be quickly folded into a matrix of sorts. And then uh, more higher end systems would be your auto matrix system, uh, pre-contoured shield and specialized rings. And then the last one is your mylar strip, which you have used before in your class three restorations. Uh, and that's a smooth pieces of plastic that don't really have a holder per se. Uh, the holder would be your fingers. So let's talk about the Toffelmeyer since that is the most commonly used matrix system and the one that we're going to use here in, in clinic. It consists of four parts. Uh, there's a head, uh, which is where you would actually insert the matrix band that we'll talk about in a second, uh, a slide, a rotating spindle, and set screw. And each one of these parts are important in the function of your matrix, so we will visit them all closely. So the bands, as I mentioned, they are made of a dead soft metal that have absolutely no uh, memory, um, meaning they won't spring back into shape. Once you fold them, they get folded very easily. Uh, they come in various thickness and shapes, and depending on their usage, that's how you would determine their shape. Uh, the ones that you see with little bumps on them, number two and number three, those are specialized matrix bands that we would use for subgingival cases. So those bumps would extend subgingively where your cable surface margin might be located on the gingival areas to help fill and contain the filling material. But the most standard one is the band that you'll see in number one. And when you take the two ends of it and, and join them together, so it looks like a boomerang to start, but when you take the two ends of the boomerang and join them together, what you end up creating is a, uh, a loop and that loop is a cone that mimics the general shape of a tooth. And when I say mimics, I mean one end has a constriction to it, it's smaller, whereas the other end is more open. And if you look at a tooth, its general shape is uh, the gingival area is more constricted than the occlusal area. So because the bands are very soft and flat, they can be contoured to mimic the shape of your tooth. Teeth generally aren't flat they need to be curved a bit, okay? So what happens is we have the band in place and we can use a spoon excavator or another instrument to help bend and shape that flat band. And of course, when you are preparing your contact area, it's really important that you burnish in where the contact would have been before you prepare the tooth. And you wanna use a fair amount of force to really deform that band into that contact point. So your loop can be extended from the matrix band in three different ways. Uh, and the three configurations are shown there in the picture. And that would allow you to keep the Toffelmeyer matrix parallel to the teeth that you're working on. You don't want it to be sort of sticking into the cheek and getting in your way. So you want to keep it where it's parallel to the teeth so it remains out of your operative field. So when placing your band, the retainer must be done in such a way that you can remove the retainer first. 
And this is something that will become clearer as you look at it clinically. It's, it's hard to talk about it, but when you lift the band off, it needs to be done so in a occlusal manner. So there's a, a slot that needs to be directed gingivally. And again, that'll make more sense when you actually see this in a clinical setting. The set screw knob, and this is the part that actually makes the band tighten around the tooth, should be pointing out towards the front of the mouth. Okay, and when the band is in place, one side of the loop, as I mentioned, has a greater diameter than the other, and the smaller diameter is always located gingivally. So you want to place this band on the tooth that is being restored. Okay, now in the event that you're using a matrix band to protect your teeth when you're prepping, that's when you want to place it on the tooth adjacent to the tooth that you're working on. Okay, but when it comes to restoring, the band in place would be on the tooth that you're restoring. The band must slide through your contact easily without bending and crimping up. And if it does, it means you haven't opened your contacts up enough and you have to go back in and, and open up more of your contacts. Your band should extend gingival to your gingival cavo surface margin. Okay, it should not be above that or occlusal to that. It needs to extend uh, by a couple of fractions of a millimeter below your gingival cavo surface margin. And once you're around the tooth uh, and in located in the correct area, you need to tighten that using the set screw. After the band is in place, you're going to have to use a wooden wedge. Wedging is very important, does a couple different things. Uh, number one, it'll ensure that your band is adapted nice and snug against the tooth. And it also causes a slight spreading in the teeth, which helps restoring a contact area. We are fortunate enough to have our teeth suspended in our alveolus through a periodontal ligament. And because of that ligament, the teeth can move ever so slightly. And so when you place a wedge securely and firmly in place, it'll cause a slight wedging action between the two teeth. That wedging action is essential because we can actually create a little space between the, the two teeth uh, and, and burnish into that, that space we create a contact point. And when you remove your wedge, the teeth will naturally spring back to their original location and now you will ensure that you have a contact point. So the wedge can be placed either on the buccal or lingual side. Uh, it's ideal to pick the side with the largest embrasure, um, which generally tends to be the buccal, uh, but in any side is fine. The one key thing is you want to make sure your wedge is located gingival to the gingival cable surface margin. If it's higher, it will cause an indentation into your your box area, creating a really funny contour to your restoration. You want to use the largest wedge that can fit into your embrasure space. You do not want to use a small wedge that creates no spread between your two teeth. After the wedge is in place, you really want to make sure that you contour the band and create a contact point. So again, using a tea burnisher or a ball burnisher, burnish in where that contact would be mimicking the size, shape, and location of the contact point should you have not removed it prior to preparation. All right, so here's an example of, of after you wedge, and you can see the location of the wedge. So it's not entirely located gingival to the capo surface margin, but it's not impeding into your box space. So removal, as I mentioned, you want to remove your wedge first, then you loosen the slide and set screw to, to disengage the matrix band from the Toffelmeyer holder, as well as its tightness around the tooth. And then while keeping the band that is wrapped around the tooth in place, remove the Toffelmeyer holder. Okay, and it's going to be done so in an occlusal direction, not a gingival direction. That's because you planned how you place that band on the tooth. Uh, and then once you get that Toffelmeyer holder off, the hard part begins, and that's removing the band from around the tooth. The amalgam that you're using is likely not fully hardened, nor should it be, because you still have to get in there and carve up the rest of your amalgam. So once you have taken off the Toffelmeyer holder, you want to use some instrument or your finger, usually a, a condenser works well, the largest condenser you have, and put apical pressure on your marginal ridge. Now the pressure should be firm enough to hold the amalgam in place, but not so firm where you break your amalgam. While you have pressure on that marginal ridge, you want to take your matrix band 
and rotate it off of the tooth, either in a facial or lingual direction. This takes some practice, and you might break your marginal ridge on the first couple of attempts. Be very gentle and careful, uh, and even the best of us can run into problems where we break our marginal ridge. And of course, if that happens, you have to start over again. All right, so here's an example, or a picture, sorry, of that Toffelmeyer uh, matrix holder. And you can see there's a slot uh, right at the end of it in the head area, and that's where your matrix band, band will sit. So here's our two examples of the matrix bands. One, the one with the, the humps on it is a subgingival, and the straight flat one is our normal everyday usage one. So when you bring the two ends of that boomerang shaped band together, you're going to create a loop. Okay, and as you can see here, there's an area that is smaller, the constricted end of that loop, um, that would go towards the gingival, and then the more open area would go towards the occlusal. So here's a close-up picture of that head, and we're going to actually insert the band into the slot here that you can see. You want to make sure that you fully engage it into that slot, and you can have it come out of one of three ways. So it can go straight through, or it can go to the left or to the right. All right, so now here's a great example. Once in place, you're going to tighten the set screw into that. And what basically happens is there's a spindle that will be driven into this little flap of band there, securing it into the matrix. All right, and so here is our narrow end, and here is our open end. And as you can see, the way this is set up, the slot is pointing gingival. So this band setup would be used in a mandibular tooth setting. Okay, so the slot is open towards the gingival area. All right, and here is, as you can see, the way we would like our Toffelmeyer matrix oriented when it's placed in a intraoral setting. You want to make sure that it's running as parallel as you can to the teeth that you're working on, and this will prevent it from sticking out into the cheek or creating some sort of obstacle when you're trying to do your work. And here is another close-up you can see of that orientation of that band. It is oriented in a gingival setting. So this open space is pointing gingivally. So when we go to remove this, it's going to be lifted in an occlusal path so as to not run itself into the gingiva or cheek.